So in this video, I would like to share with you an interesting article that I've just read actually this night when I couldn't sleep. And this is in fact a magazine. Before we dive into that, it's about the temporary bato in the 18th century. Because, because before we go into that, I want to take a moment just to share with you this wonderful magazine. This is a number, an issue from 1994. I, um, have bought recently all or almost all old editions of the clavichord it's called today clavichord international i will put a link in the description box if you're interested in reading great articles and being updated of all things that happen actually in a really a global clavichord world because um, the Clavichord International Society is very well organized. Then I recommend you check out links of Clavichord societies nearby you and go for that magazine. It, it contains always interesting and very good, profound, deep articles. Um, so the Clavichord world is, is really a wonderful world to, to, to go into if you are not yet. So I was reading through a pile of old editions a very interesting article written by paul simmons and simmons is a really great player i will link his website in the description box as well you can check him out and he wrote an article about performance practice from 18th century sources a look at the rebuttal style and that's very interesting it made clear in my mind some issues that I was thinking on really for years. And we dive into some works of Mozart and Beethoven that are related to this article. Not that he mentions Mozart and Beethoven, but I point to some examples. But before we do that, I give you a very short summary. Also reflection to myself, you know that we're going i'm going to close to read cpe bach is 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 together with you from september maybe october onwards afterwards we're going to do gottlob turk turk i've read really intense but seeing a quote from turk in this article learns me that it's really necessary that i go through it again I've said before, often it's not to prove something, but it's to generate ideas. All these sources are written by people who lived in the original time. And if I read them, it's like these people are speaking to you. So the only thing we need to do is try to understand it, and which is not easy because we have always a reflection of our time that we take to that. So basically what Paul Simmons is saying, and he's very right when he starts saying one of the most unfortunate results of the changing attitudes to music which occurred during the 19th century is the tendency to regard written note values as sacred. And that's really true. Having been in the piano class um, in Amsterdam, you know that if you play Mozart, you have to play it by heart from memory. And that's really difficult. And I, I'm speaking now the 90s, maybe it changed today, to add a note or an even a trill that you want to start with the upper note. You better not do that on an examination. But he is very right in the 18th century, this notation form was a tool that was not complete, as you can imagine that if you write a note on a paper, uh, it says so little about the accentuation, about the dynamics, about its place in the context of the piece. And then he, he continues, continues by directing to Gottlob Turk, which is not surprising because compared Turk and Emmanuel Bach have two very related sources, although Turk is much later, but is more, much more detailed than CPE Bach is. Um, so he's heading to Gottlob Turk in his article and Turk lists examples of, and what he quotes, expression heightened by extraordinary means. And then again, Turk includes one, 
by playing without keeping steady time, two, by quickening and hesitating, and three, the so-called tempo rubato. And that's interesting because we talked about the tempo rubato a few weeks ago when I made the afterthoughts videos on the CPE Bach Württemberg uh, Sonata. I was saying that I'm really referring to actually what I realize now is a modern view on tempo rubato, which is slightly uh, playing with the time, with, with, with the steady time, just slowing down a little bit and going up a little bit. Um, which is very uh, a very um, great tool of expression in that music, but actually tempo rubato, which it, Paul Simmons is referring to in this article, article, is something else, and I want to share it with you. So, and again, Turk uh, quoting the so-called rubato has more than one meaning. So this is quote from Gottlob Turk's Versuch, seventeen eighty nine. Commonly, it is understood as a kind of shortening or lengthening of notes or the displacement of these. There is something taken away, stolen, from the duration of a note and for this another note is given that much more as in the following examples B and C. So it's, he's giving Turk this example. So it's very four quarter notes. So anticipation or uh, retardation. So all these variations are under the definition of what God Lutuk would call tempo rubato. I'm coming to Mozart and Beethoven in a second. Then he continues at A, so this one. Tempo rubato is put to use by means of the anticipation, that's what you do by playing the, the next note a little bit early, and at C by retardation, so making the, the right hand uh, playing the notes late. So from this it can be seen again, quoted from Turk, can be seen that through this kind of execution the tempo or even more the meter as a whole is not displaced so what he's saying is we keep steady tempo the bass voice goes its way according to the meter and only the notes of the melody are moved out of place as it were even more notes are added to the melody as in examples e and f so it's continuing that both voices must nevertheless correctly coincide coincide each time at the beginning of the measure. So what he's saying is, in this example here, uh, which sounds in the original version like this, and then it's continuing, he is, we would call it ornamenting, but it's actually a kind of additional temporary battle by anticipation. And then by retardation, Left hand keeps steady in time, right hand is differing. And then he continues to another source, Paul Simmons, to a wolf, which describes the rubato as follows, uh, but gives no written example of the common or syncopated form. So what he, what he says is that he is giving a different definition by rubato compared to Kotlup Tuk. So he um, gives another dis definition or adds to that the following. This type of ornament, uh, syncopation, is used in adagio as well as allegro. Often composers will write out in full notation since it consists of anticipating as well as retarding and thus is a constant, consistent form of melodic figuration. And we're coming close to Mozart now. Since, um, okay, much the same as syncopation in present day music. And then follows the whole quote and then, interesting, He's giving an example um, by changing, by ornamenting, like we would say today, a certain musical figure or a certain um, uh, fragment with five notes per beat or with seven notes per beat, even with nine notes. And this Mr. Wolf again 
says be careful with that that's for real professionals but if you do that you get the impression and now we come very close to Mozart that the right hand is out of time while the left hand is within time so I give you the example it's written out it's written like this the normal example then he's playing what we call in Dutch quinto or another example so. so the right hand has nine notes and that's of course not fitting into any normal meter so Mozart is very interesting in this we have the sonata in f major and i don't think i've done that already on the channel so we will have to do this sonata soon because it's one of my favorites and the middle part is really unbelievable sounds really great on collaboration So playing this from the Neue Mozart Ausgabe, you will see that in the repeat of this adagio, so a part is being repeated, Mozart adds, not in his autograph, but in the print, and we can assume that this printed edition is um, adding his own ornaments, or what Turco Wolf would call his own tempo rubato. And then he's, he's adding also runs with seven and nine notes per beat or per eight note which gives a kind of feel of freedom in the right hand and it's actually difficult to play not too difficult but you have to keep your left hand steady so if you do that and if you can imagine as a player that you would add ornamentation like this while playing steady in the left hand you would get the impression that your right hand is playing in a different meter than your left hand and you know there is a famous letter i think where mozart himself reacts on a comment that he got while he played and i should have i should look it up but you will probably know the letter in which he writes to his father that people were astonished and were wondering how he could play in his right hand in a different kind of meter than in his left hand and i have often wondered what that really could mean because it's impossible you cannot play in another meter in another time in your right hand than your left hand but you can play a cycle of notes that adds more than four, eight, or whatever fits in the normal meter, giving the impression that your left hand is guiding and your right hand is just doing something difficult because you're going out of time, out of meter maybe, but you fall on the right moment back in the bar. Beethoven in his first sonata is taking this even further um, in his middle section. So that's the adagio part of opus 2 number 1 and then he continues and he does it differently he goes he adds uh, six notes above it sounds like that so you have this kind of triplet feeling and then at the right hand difficult so according to what I've read now you should keep the left hand steady and play the right hand as if it 
never will come back in uh, in in the same time. And I read actually now what I've written above this passage. It is quoted by Czerny. So in German, the 32 stell der rechten Hand sehr zart und völlig unabhängig von der yeah, what he means in English is the 30 second note, so the ornamentation, very independent from the right hand. That's actually the same thing. That's great, actually, too. It's difficult, actually. That's not okay. You can find many examples of this. So that's for me was a wonderful article. I certainly will try to reach Paul Simmons and send him a mail to thank him for this article. That's written more than 20 years ago. I was lying next to my bed just for a moment during the night to read. Second thing, historical sources are not there to prove. I would really like to open that platform of research, I'm doing it daily and I'm, I'm doing it anyway, uh, open our minds to research and to experimentation and accepting from each other different views, which is great. That makes every one of us better, makes it enjoyable, makes it fun. And sharing that with you, being able to share that with you is of course fantastic. I learn from historical sources in this way that by rereading them, as I do now, they reflect upon problems that occurred after I read them for the first time. And there's, there's a solution or there's an understanding. And the next thing a musician has to do is take that to the performance level and interpret. And that's the most difficult part, the most fun part, but, and the most essential part again. Again, closing. Read Clap, that's an old number. Read Clap, the Code International. Go to the websites, order it, because I think you support all these societies. They're doing great work, very scientific, and the community, Clap, the Code community, is really wonderful. So thanks for watching, and next time we will have more of these um, not scheduled, non scheduled videos talking about some issues. Thanks for watching, subscribing sharing the video as always. See you next time. Bye.